Now to a CBS2 exclusive. Interviews on camera of the FBI questioning the prime suspect in the 1982 Tylenol murders. The newly released video and documents paint a picture of how authorities worked for years to charge James Lewis for those poisonings, but never could. Lewis died last month. CBS2 investigator Dave Savini has the video you'll see only on two. The CBS2 investigators just obtained these videos and records revealing how the FBI repeatedly recorded conversations with James Lewis. These conversations were both in person and over the phone, at least 34 of them from 2007 to 2009. It was all happening as the unsolved murder case was reopened. According to authorities, the interviews were consensually recorded. How, uh, how closely do you think these people have watched in those stories? 2008, a seemingly relaxed James Lewis sitting in a hotel room wearing shorts and a t-shirt theorizes with Special Agent Roy Lane about how someone, even a 15-year-old, with the right knowledge could have easily laced capsules with cyanide, killing seven people without leaving a trace of evidence. So yeah, I think that 15-year-olds uh, could have, could have uh, had uh, enough... Uh, the awareness. Awareness to know to, to try to avoid cameras. And he explains while avoiding getting caught on the few drugstore security cameras that existed back then in 1982. We were out a bottle a month before and played with it until they got it right. Sounds to me like somebody did a premix. That would be my assumption. Open the bottle, toss them, walk to the next shelf, walk to the next door, or whatever. I want to get the mental picture of what you were just saying about the person taking it out of their clothes and taking capsules out of their clothes. Capsules in some in some form, uh, either loose capsules out of a pocket, out of an envelope, or a miniature. Then Lewis grabs a pen and paper and draws it all out. This is what's necessary to make a box. There's the lid. So this is folded over. You got your box, your paper clip. Okay. One movement, you got the paper clip opened up. And that's all the bending you need. There's your hook for picking up the copy. There's a lift, reach underneath here, lift this up, pull it out. Pull it out of the box. Any clothes on? You know, got your clothes on. It's already pre-folded. This is the lid. Sort of line it up. Roughly line it up and whack it. It wasn't the first time Lewis speculated on how the crime could have been committed. Lewis had a pattern of researching, theorizing, and demonstrating to investigators how he thought the killer got away with it. This is his uh, drilled board method. Like this drawing that Lewis made for former federal prosecutor Jeremy Margolis. And he did a lot of drawings, pen and ink drawings, uh, proposing how the killer might have filled these capsules with the Tylenol that killed these people, where you drill these holes into this little plywood contraption, put the bottom capsule uh, into this hole, uh, put a mound of cyanide on top of the board, scrape it across with a bread knife, uh, clean up the excess, put the tops of the capsules in, load them into the, sign, uh, into the Tylenol bottles and put them uh, on the store shelves. He first offered his assistance to the FBI after he was convicted of writing a letter demanding a million dollars from Tylenol's maker Johnson & Johnson to stop the killings. He also sent a letter to then-President Ronald Reagan threatening to attack the White House if he didn't change his tax policies. I still have a very vivid image of my hands and uh, my writing. I'm seeing it in my hands as it's irrelevant. But I don't remember the timeline. That timeline of when the letters were written and sent is critical because if investigators could prove Lewis wrote them before the murders, it could have implicated him. I'm just trying to figure out when day, what day was the digit? He wrote the Tylenol letter. So take the Reagan letter and go back three days. Uh, probably not as much, but at least two days on it. So you would have written, started writing it on about on September 30th? 
kind of under the same term. I see your hunger. Looks like my memory was involved in that it didn't work. Right, I'm working on it for three days, and it just seems like I worked on it for three days because that's where I usually do things. Yeah, because basically, I was. You, you would started. have written the letter the same day they were. Yeah, well, dying. Yeah, well, that didn't happen. Uh, all in memory. Lewis repeatedly talks about how methodical he is and even explains the steps he took to try and not leave any evidence behind with each letter he sent through the mail. I knew that, that could be traced. The DNA, for sure. Uh, fairly certain when I dropped them in boxes rather than going to the post office because there was going to be a photograph going into the post office. But I know some of them had cameras. I walked quite a ways away. I didn't want to know precisely what part of town that I was living in. So I wouldn't walk, you know, there might be a post office box right outside my apartment. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew not to use that one. Records also show Lewis gave investigators several items as part of these conversations, including articles related to the Tylenol murders and an original artwork he titled Tylenol Suspect for Life. Other records we obtained related to the Tylenol murders reveal in 2010, investigators found his fingerprints on a book titled Handbook of Poisonings. Remember, Lewis died one month ago at his home in Massachusetts of natural causes. We are told the Tylenol case is still open. Dave Savini, CBS2 Investigators. We have spent nearly two years digging into the case file and Lewis's life. For a look back at our extensive reporting, head to cbschicago.com slash painkiller.